everyone. I'm Tom Monian, President and CEO of DeVry University. During this digital dialogue, I'll be speaking with my friend and colleague, Julius Janikowski, Managing Director in the Carlisle Group's U.S. Buyout Team and former FCC Chair. Uh, Julius has obviously served as a policymaker and recently as an investor in the sector. And in his tenure as chairman and his tenure as an investor, uh, the FCC took major actions to extend broadband access, roll out advanced mobile networks, and preserve a vibrant internet and media landscape. Uh, since transitioning back to the private sector, he's been on the cutting edge of leading investments that take advantage of the digi digitization of services for both consumers and businesses. Because of his expertise, I'm excited for Julius to join me as we explore the latest developments in broadband and it, how it may be impacting the next generation of the workforce. Welcome, Julius. Hey, Tom. Um, I'm just going to start with your story. Uh, you, you trained as a lawyer, you clerked for the Supreme Court, and you kind of crossed over into business and specifically the technology business and kind of never looked back. But I'd love to hear you tell your your, your own story and uh, your words. What what you know what drew you to the sector and what's kept you in the sector? Well, you know, I I went into law and law school uh, thinking I'd be a lawyer. Uh, I I wasn't one of the students who did that as um, you know the the leftover option. And uh, and I actually I love law school. I love the law. Um, but after spending a couple of years as a as a law clerk and thinking about what the future might look like, I realized that um, I didn't want to be an expert in legal process. I, I had this insight that, you know, what, what almost um, whatever you do over time, you become an expert in something. And um, I liked the idea of being an expert in legal process, but I didn't love the idea of being an expert in legal process. And I thought, you know, I think I'd probably enjoy more um, really digging into something, a, a subject matter. And I've always been a little bit of a tech geek. My, my dad who's an immigrant is a, an engineer. I was always an early adopter of consumer tech. Um, this was around the, the dawn of the internet. And I just thought, wow, um, this, this, the, you know, the area of technology, technology, media, telecommunications, that's a fun area. And I might do some law in that area. I might do some policy. I might do some business. I don't really know. And so I, I made that shift and I went from the Supreme Court actually to become, uh, to join the staff of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, really to kind of dig into that space. And it stuck. I've spent, you know, my entire career since then in and around tech media te telecom, so it's been a, a mix of government policy, a little bit of law, and then over the last number of years, uh, uh, business and investing. One of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about at DeVry is obviously our, our, our mission is to give people access to uh, careers in the technology economy, which in big, simple terms is more and more and more of the economy every single day. You must get asked for, you know, we spend, this infuses our curriculum as we think about how we help people, you know, find the right path through engineering technology, through computer science, through cyber, through digital health, whatever the right path is into the technology economy. You must get asked for uh, career advice uh, on a reasonably regular basis. And, you know, as you think about your journey so far, what what are the if someone's starting out or pursuing an education or thinking about a career pivot? What sort of advice do you give them about you know f finding a home in a in in a series in industry after industry that's being reshaped by technology? Yeah, I I am. Um, I think it helps a lot to like what you do. Uh, I, I think if you kind of look at people over the course of their career and people who, you know, found uh, jobs, found good jobs, advancing in their career, more often than not, they actually like uh, the the area that they're in. And, and so I think my I, the single look, the advice I give my kids is um, find something you really enjoy because uh, you're more likely to be good at that and advance and have optionality than if you're doing something that you don't enjoy. Now, nothing's perfect and you know you don't love everything and sometimes you're in something and you have to look for what uh, what is it about it that you really enjoy. But that's number one. And then that relates to, I think the second piece, which is, and this is definitely true around technology, say, you know, versus history. You know, if you're, if you're teaching history, if you're an expert in history, 
Um, to a certain extent, you only have to learn it once. Now, yep. that's not really true, yep. but um, yep. but if you're around technology, it's really a lifetime learning kind of space. I think that's one of the attractions of being in the technology space. It's it's exhilarating. It's interesting. It's it's a great area for for the curious. But it gets to this next thing where to to be successful in technology over time, it helps to have you know both uh, a good basis, a good base in the 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 skills uh, and the tech, and then also a desire. Uh, not just a willingness, but a desire and at some level a hunger to keep on learning because technology keeps on changing. If anything, the pace of change uh, is accelerating. Yeah, it's funny. That's obviously cyber is a hot area everywhere right now in security and info security and data, data security. And it's been really interesting that there's this um, almost two pronged approach to education where there's a baseline understanding of how technology works and then a perpetual change every week, every month and threat vectors and uh, the technologies used to compete against them. So it's really interesting. Our faculty are having to think through, you know, what is what never changes? What's sort of the three foot shelf of stuff that you're always going to want to know? And then how to how do you, you know, ha have the feed stream that comes in across time T talk a little bit, if you would, around um, you, you, you as an investor, you see not only technology companies, but see companies where technology is basically changing the business. How do you, it, it's, it, 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 in some sense, being a technology investor uh, means being an investor in almost every sector in the economy these days. How do you, you know, what do you look for? Where, how, do you, how do you think about approaching such a vast canvas and, and where you place bets or what themes you find really attractive? Yeah, well, actually I'll start not with themes, Tom, but with, with people uh, and the management team and the folks running the company. Uh, and that's in some ways, uh, you know, it, it's a key part of what we look at because of this point about technology constantly changing and the competitive landscape constantly changing. Whatever business you, you happen to be looking at, if it's not run by someone who has the ability to run a business successfully, but also adapt to new technologies in a changing landscape, it's just not gonna work. So people really matter, even if your expertise and your focus is technology. Now, it's not the only thing that matters. You know, the, the second thing, I think certainly for later stage investors, like we are at Carlisle, um, you can look at business metrics. Uh, you know, has the business been growing or not? If it's been growing, how fast is it growing? Is it grow? How is it growing compared to its um, competitors, compared to the market overall? You can look at its profitability. You know, is it making money or is it losing money? How does its profitability compare to others in the market? Uh, it, it's 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 better to invest in a high quality business than to invest in a low quality business, as measured by its actual performance. But the third thing is. You know, there's a there are a lot of people who want to invest in really good businesses. So you know, if you find a really good business, and you uh, you find a really good management team, I guess the I, I actually I should mention one other thing. You asked about themes. Um, you know, you do want to have a point of view on whether the business is benefiting from thematic tailwinds. You know, are things happening around technology in the marketplace and customer consumer adoption that are good for the business or is it facing headwinds? So you want to have that point of view. I phrase the question that simply. Uh, and then finally, you know, if you actually want to um, not just admire a company, but invest in it, you need ultimately to be able to win the deal and convince the decision maker that you're the best investor. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do that. At Carlisle, we spent a lot of time thinking about how can Carlisle as an investor add value? You know, what can we do to support the, the management team uh, to help them achieve, you know, accomplish their objectives to grow uh, and to speed up their growth, et, et cetera? Yeah. It's really the, back to your lifelong learning point, like companies need to be lifelong learners in a strange way, right? They have to be willing to grow and change. And you, you as an investor, you have to be able to sort of seed that that sort of intellectual and Lifelong learning growth through the resources and assets. Let me let me go back to um, I, I, I don't know if you'd call it your your signature achievement as FCC chair, but certainly like the media would call it a, a really important. But the national broadband plan, and uh, you know we're still seeing 
you know, that that come to fruition. Uh, you know, the, the, the most recent dialogue has been about 5G, but it was a um, uh, it was, um, you know, a much broader ambition. And it's be, it's being realized in lots of different exciting ways. And and I think it, w- through the lens of the pandemic, we could say and not a moment too soon, because if if that hadn't been in place, it's hard to imagine how we would have sur- survived as an economy. But can you talk a little bit about what it was, why you prioritized it, why it mattered, um, and uh, and just kind of the the genesis of it, and 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 you know n- now watching it having rolled out, kind of what what you're most proud of. Yeah, uh, boy, it, it's the you know it's interesting to talk about now, as you said, Tom, coming out of COVID and the ways in which broadband has really mattered for just our 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 country and the world, making it making it through COVID and lockdowns and everything else. But to turn the clock back a little bit, when I was at the FCC and we did the national broadband plan, I'd say a couple of things. One is no one even knew what broadband meant. Uh, And and, uh, we actually did some kind of um, some a little bit of testing of that. And it was just a word that applied to something to do with the Internet. And no one understood that it meant high speed Internet. And in fact, the Internet wasn't widely available. And in fact, the Internet at the time was primarily dial up and slow. Very early days of the Internet. We did the national broadband plan. And, you know, we started working on it in 2008 when um, uh, candidate Obama called for it in his in his campaign and really started on it in 2009. Uh, And, uh, you know, there were a few things that were pretty clear right from the start. One is that the Internet uh, could provide enormous opportunities that it could create opportunities for new businesses, new investment, new jobs, lots of new jobs, um, that it could help um, uh, in various important verticals like education, healthcare, public safety. So that was really clear. Um, The details of it weren't clear, but conceptually it was clear because new technologies always do that. They have opportunities and then they also have challenges. Um, and you know the obvious challenges, or at least the challenges we were focused on at the time, were okay. Um, how do we get broadband to everyone everywhere? And it's a real challenge because networks have to be built out. Uh, it requires investment to do that. It's harder to build out networks in some areas than others. It's harder to build out a profitable network in a rural area than an urban area. Um, and we're just talking about wired um, broadband f- uh, for the moment. Uh, another challenge that we knew we would see is universal access, not just in terms of physically being able to get broadband, but being able to afford broadband. You know, and so you live in an urban area and broadband passes your home, but you know the bills are expensive. What do you do? Yep. And then, and then it was very early days of wireless broadband, and. We knew that would be a real challenge too, because uh, it, it's it's nice to imagine that maybe uh, wireless broadband relies on an, an infinite infrastructure. That you know, if you're sending signals from one place to another, it doesn't look like there's any um, you know any obstacles in the way. But as it turns out, spectrum itself is a finite resource, mm-hmm. and you need more spectrum to have faster wireless broadband. And that's a complex thing. Mm -hmm. And so what the National Broadband Plan really set out to do was one, uh, better define the opportunities. What were we trying to accomplish by promoting universal wired and wireless broadband? And then more important, what is a, a plan to revise rules and policies, et cetera, to to accomplish those objectives. So the National Broadband Plan itself was a plan. It was a strategic plan. It was a very detailed strategic plan uh, uh, with an an extraordinary team. We did that early in my tenure at the FCC, and it really became the the four-year or uh, strategic plan for the agency. I say four years, because when you take over an agency like that, you really don't know if you're gonna have more than four years, right? Because the country gets to decide mm-hmm. yep, uh, yep. what happens with the, you know, with the, uh, uh, in the next presidential election. And, and so we were very focused and it's a great forcing event. What can we get done in four years? 
But that wasn't the only thing. You know, there were longer term initiatives in there as well. And, and I'm glad that we did it because uh, a couple of things that I'll say right now. One is we, we weren't the first country in the world to do a national broadband plan, but we were the first country in the world to include wireless broadband as part of the thinking. And that turned out to be really important because we would not have the, you know, we wouldn't have 5G. We wouldn't mm -hmm. even have 4G if we mm -hmm. hadn't really focused early on how do we clear more of the airwaves for broadband. And then the next thing I'm proud of is that um, in addition to the horizontal challenges of, all right, how do we build out broadband everywhere? How do we try to make progress on affordability? We also looked at these verticals. Um, what about education? What's it going to take to really harness the benefits of broadband and education? How about healthcare? What's it really going to take? What are the obstacles? Same thing for public safety. And I, I'm really glad that we did that. Uh, it opened the door for the FCC to do a number of things, but also for the FCC to work in concert with the education department in, in, in Washington, but also local um, you know, uh, education bodies, state and local on a, a a coordinated set of policies, same thing in healthcare. So I'm pretty happy with, you know, I think we tackled the right issues, we worked really hard and and we got uh, the US to, to a good start. Listen, one of the ways you can measure it is, at the time, uh, the US was behind Europe, South Korea, Japan in 3G. Right. Uh, the, the, these, those, the, the, all those other countries had faster wireless speeds than we did in the U.S. Uh, but by 4G, that had changed and the U.S. had rolled out 4G with more spectrum, um, more infrastructure than those other countries. And that helped spur a cycle of innovation, job creation that's been you know, quite, quite positive. You know, it's interesting. interesting. You you could look at the you know the the pandemic and COVID and and the it could be seen first as a stress test on our uh, on our broadband infrastructure that we um, you know there's a lot not to like about a pandemic obviously but you, you at least have to say as an economy we adapted very quickly and effectively uh, and the data data would support that. Uh, and even probably more equitably than we could have imagined 10 years ago. I, I know the equity issues aren't solved, but uh, but for the national broadband plan, it would have been it, could, it would have been uh, a very different scenario. It, yeah. no, I'll say one thing about that that yeah. people often miss in this in this area, uh, and that I'm I'm glad we really highlighted and set in motion a set of policies that helped. Um, the, the broadband isn't the first technology that America tried to universalize. Right. So we universalized electricity. We yeah. got it to every part of the country. We universalized telephone service. We got it to everyone. And so in some ways you could look at broadband and say, oh, OK, um, yep. it's the next thing. Let's just like do yep. that stuff. But yep. we realized early in our work on the national broadband plan that there was one critical difference between broadband on one hand and telephone and electricity on the other hand. And that is that telephone, electricity, are binary, right? Yep. Either you have it or you don't. You have a dial tone or you yep. don't. Broadband is different, right? You can have slow, medium, fast broadband, and what was fast five years ago is pretty slow today for the um, software and products that, that people use. And building that into the policy framework ended up being really important because we, we designed a set of policies to make sure essentially that we would never be satisfied with where we were on broadband because we just assumed that innovators would take advantage of faster and faster broadband. And so even if on the rural area, uh, rural issue, if you get you know a broadband wire to uh, a rural community, um, that's not the end. Because uh, yep. that might be, yep. you know, just not enough capacity for fast broadband. Um, and then similarly for the affordability issue, you know, if you if you get someone onto an on ramp for slow broadband, well, that's a start, but it's not yep. it's not the end. And I think that um, created some resiliency and some I don't know being ahead of the curveness in our broadband uh, strategizing that we benefited from 
in the in the pandemic. And I'm not saying and you're not saying that everything went perfectly and that everyone had the broadband they needed when they needed. Of course not. Yeah. Uh, but I do think we were in better shape than one might have thought we we would have been. Yeah. One, one of the funny things, and you and I have seen this in a lot of boardrooms, which is, um, you know, it, it, five years ago, four years ago, there was a lot of talk in most boardrooms around business continuity planning. How would the biz, how would the business react to an event that made it impossible to go to headquarters, made it necessary for all people? And, and ironically, it's I, I would say one topic that's gone down in importance is most boards have seen their organizations be very resilient and able to adapt and respond in ways that would have been inconceivable even even five years ago. So, uh, you know, and that that includes uh, the, the you know co companies in every sector, including the three: education, healthcare, and public safety. That you just the the way those sectors, our sector and others operate, uh, would have uh, boggled the mind five years ago. Maybe just flipping a little bit to you know the the pandemic in many respect um, uh, fr from strictly a technology standpoint, compressed a cycle of innovation and adoption that could have taken 10 years into about two years. Uh, you know, you can pick any statistic you want, which is what percentage of students at any level had had class online in 2018 and effectively that answer now is everyone has been to class online so that compressed adoption and you know, compressed innovation same with healthcare percentage of, uh, of primary care visits that were conducted via telehealth in 2018 was probably one ish percent it's probably close to 50 percent now um and, and so you know we, we've had the chance to compress adoption and innovation of uh of technology and and, and digital ways of of shopping, working, and living. What has sort of caught your eye? What has surprised you? <laughs> Just, it's kind of curious as to, you know, this one, this use case seemed really important, didn't matter. This use case was, you know, widely and quickly adopted and proved to be really important. Just kind of, just what what has caught your eye and what surprised you as, as we've yeah. come through this period? The thing, that, the thing that caught my eye actually was uh, how much of the, kind of product infrastructure was already in place, right? So it's it's not like um, Zoom or Teams, you know, um, was invented after the lockdown, yep. right? It's not that Shopify was invented after the lockdown. It's not that, you know, AWS came after the lockdown and you can go on and on you know soft you know cloud based software as a services business it's not like the ability for a company to connect with its customers remotely only the the ability that uh, started there so what's what's been interesting to me was uh the the bets that so many different innovators made across the landscape on what a broadband world could look like in the future uh were proven to be really smart bads, no question that the pandemic accelerated the the trends. Uh, but that's the single thing that impresses me the most. That for the most part, when it came to the technology and the platforms, they were already there. My second point here is that um, in some of the areas where we saw the most rapid innovation was um, less. Uh, technology than policy. What do I mean by that? And by the way, I'm not saying that, you know, there wasn't a whole ton of new technological innovation during the pandemic. There was. And some of it we see and some of it we won't see um, for another year or two or more. But the thing that happened fast, you know, relatively fast during the pandemic was the, the ecosystems, particularly in some of the verticals, shifted. So take um, uh, telehealth. Right. So telehealth wasn't invented during the pandemic. It's it, it's existed for a while. The platforms were there, but they were very slow in being adopted for a few different reasons. Some of it was, you know, there were reasons that some of the uh, the main users of it didn't use it. There were reasons that, you know, some doctors didn't really want to use it. Some patients didn't really like using it. Well, all of a sudden, when um, there's a strong reason for doctor and patient to communicate with each other, uh, through a screen, and that can really help. 
um, whether it's you know physical health or, or mental health, well, the platform was there. Um, in some cases, there had to be changes made to policy to accommodate that. So, you know, insurance reimbursement for remote um, telehealth consultations. Uh, uh, that, you know, uh, enabling that made a big difference. You would know better than me, but there are a whole series of, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, p policy decisions that had to be made, both as, as kind of a legal regulatory matter, but also as a um, uh, an educational institution matter to say, all right, we're just changing what, you know, we, this, this thing we wouldn't allow in the past, and now we're allowing it. So I, I've been impressed by the speed of that. We haven't always gotten it right. And, you know, I'm worried that, you know, kids will never see snow days again, because like schools can just, you know, say, oh, no, it's a remote day, which I, I think that would be a tragedy. But, um, uh, but I, as I said, I'm, I'm impressed by how much of the innovation infrastructure was already in place, not just the hardwired and wireless broadband infrastructure, but the, but the products that people and businesses use and are using now during uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, no, it's been it, and and you know it, w whatever we believe about behavioral change at the two year mark, a lot of these changes are now permanent. You know, so not only is the infrastructure permanent, but the human whatever cognitive adoption biases we might have had um, uh, have been. You know, it's been interesting. Our our, prof our professors who pioneered a lot of remote learning, not just the technology, but how do you actually get a conversation going? A, uh, um, how do you get a conversation going in a virtual classroom? Um, uh, you know, that that has really, you know, students now sort of expect that. And that's a totally different frame of mind. And they, our professors are able to leverage that in exciting and compelling new ways. One last question for you. Um, we, we uh, one idea that um, uh, we've been trying to drive forward is the idea that it, it, you'll remember the five foot shelf that was uh, anything anyone needed to know. The Harvard Classics and Charles William Elliott said, "Hey, if you read everything on the shelf, you'll you'll know everything you need to know to be an educated human being." Um, uh, I don't know if that was ever a great idea, but but we're trying to update that for the digital age. Uh, to say what would and it won't be five foot shelf. It might just be a th it would be a thumb drive or whatever. And but we're I'm always curious to collect. You know what? Um, if you were to share with you know, our students, faculty, friends, and family of the institution, what what you you know are influenced by as a, as a reader, as a listener, what you know could could be book, could be a podcast, could be a whatever. Um, uh, you know, what, what you'd nominate for inclusion on the five foot shelf or two gig drive or whatever it is that we're putting <laughs> together. What, what's it, what's on your listen, read, um, you know, ingest, uh, uh, list. Yeah, it's good. It's a, it's a great, it's a great question, Tom. I, uh, I, I, I read a book recently that I'd, I'd recommend for inclusion, uh, on it. And it's a, it's a book called Ask Your Developer uh, by Jeff Lawson. Uh, Jeff, Jeff happens to be the, the founder and CEO of Twilio, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, a company that was started before the pandemic and then really benefited from the pandemic in the way that you know, it enables developers to work in a whole series of technologies, phone calls, text, what, you know, whatnot. Anyway, he's, he's written a great book um, his background, by the way, I should say, is uh, he was very early at AWS, Amazon's cloud service, in helping build that from an idea to an actual business that that really has changed the world in, in significant ways. And then he also uh, had an unsuccessful startup and has that experience. And uh, it's it's actually it's a terrific book. One because um, it explains a lot of the tech around. Uh, the cloud and platform software platforms like Twilio built, you know, around the cloud in a way that's uh, sophisticated but accessible. And then mm -hmm. it's also a really great book about starting businesses. Uh, his stories are are, are 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 great, as are the lessons from the stories. And then second, scaling businesses, which is mm -hmm. you know a separate skill set, as you know. Anyway, I like that book a lot. I'll, I'll mention a couple of others that um, are a little bit older. And you know, in technology, when you recommend older books, in some ways they're always going to be a little bit out of date. But they also, in some cases, reflect a style of thinking that's helpful in technology. So one is a book called The Big Switch by Nicholas Carr, 
Um, and it's really, it's a history of universalizing electricity, but uh, in a way that's relevant to broadband. Um, and uh, uh, I'd recommend that. And I'd recommend a book called The Power of Productivity by Michael Lewis, which is a book that uh, digs into uh, why productivity is a good thing, how technology increases productivity and why that's a good thing, and also is revealing on the ways in which it's not a straight line process, right? Because technology disrupts. Disruption means that some companies get hurt and some jobs are lost. And the argument for why on a net basis, productivity and disruption creates more jobs than it destroys. I, and I, I, you know, I, I go back and forth on whether or not I really believe that argument, um, but it's a great book for, for laying that out. I guess I'll just mention one, one, uh, one more um, problem solving is just so important in the technology world as a, you know, as an approach. And uh, I watched, uh, I rewatched um, a movie called The Martian. Um, uh, but, you know, Matt Damon is in the movie. The book is by Andy Weir. And basically, you know, an astronaut kind of gets stuck on Mars alone and he has to figure out how to survive. And it's actually it's a really good book on. All right. Now, what do I do? Uh, I've got some problems to solve. How do I go about, you know, solving them one one step at a time? As one of my my mentors, you know, used to say, Barry Diller used to say, just one foot in front of another. How do I solve a complicated problem? Just one step at a time. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. It's funny. The productivity issue is one that I, you know, there's been a long running debate around automation and whether it will, you know, this this next wave of technology will, you know, prove uh, the the productivity will come at the cost of opportunity. And and yeah, I've been tempted. I've been long on the uh, long on the side of you know, the over time certainly there will be pockets of disruption and we have work to do to help those pockets uh, transition. But over time. Uh, technology change is inevitably going to boom for the economy. And I'm tempted with the late labor uh, situation we find ourselves in right now um, to say, I told you so. But every time I ever say I told you so, I'm proven immediately wrong on the other side. So I'm not going to, there will be no spiking the football here. Uh, Julius, thank you for joining. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate uh, your sharing uh, your time and your perspective with our audience on this topic. I hope our audience found it useful as well. Uh, and obviously, I'll, I'll be out on LinkedIn and uh, other places uh, fostering conversation on some of the topics that came up today. Thanks, Tom. Great to do this with you. Thanks, Susan.